Hi everybody, thanks for joining me. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to hit subscribe to my channel to keep up with all of my latest investing and personal finance content. And please check out the link you see on your screen for a message from our sponsor, The Motley Fool, where you can get the 10 best stocks to buy right now. So one of my favorite real estate stocks in the market right now is a company called EPR Properties. I recently bought some of it. I know a few of our other colleagues have recently added it to their portfolios. The stock's been beaten down, and it's been beaten down in kind of a weird way, right? It outperformed the market for most of 2022. I think until about August, it was the best performer in my portfolio for the year. And then one of its largest tenants, uh, Regal Entertainment, their parent company, filed bankruptcy. And that was that. It joined the rest of the stocks that we own that are down 30 or 40%. Um, so... Now it yields something close to 8%, uh, big dividend yield. So obviously there are some negatives here. So I guess I'll go first with the reasons I like tank or I like uh, EPR properties. So the regal issue I think is very overblown. For one thing, EPR's properties are generally top tier movie theaters. Um, Almost all, I think 96% of its properties are in the top half of all U.S. movie theaters by box office revenue, for example. Rent is pretty high in the capital stack in cases of bankruptcy. The short version is companies generally have to continue to pay their rent obligations if they want to keep op operating their theaters. Regal has no intention of shutting down its business. So I'm, I have to think that most of the 50 or so theaters they rent from EPR are going to remain open and they're going to keep paying rent. And they actually did pay all of their rent in the Regal properties in October and November after a pause in September because that's when they filed bankruptcy. Um, so re EPR recently raised its guidance for the full year. Its business is doing so well, and that's inclusive of the Regal uncertainty. The company is a great, one of the best balance sheets in the real estate that I've seen. Um, they haven't even tapped into their credit line. They have over $160 million in cash. Um, we, what we saw in the COVID pandemic is they can break even with about 15% rent collection because they have a very light debt load. They don't have a big interest expense. Uh, and that also gives them a lot of flexibility to grow. They're trying to actively diversify away from movie theaters over time. And the dividend they pay doesn't represent all of their FFO. They actually have a very nice cash flow after paying their dividend, they plan on funding $250 million of, act, of development activity over the next two years without having to raise capital, which as a real estate company, Tyler, you follow re, uh, REITs a lot. That's pretty rare to be able to fund that kind of development without, you know, selling new shares or taking on more debt. So what am I missing? Why should I be a little more cautious on UPR? Well, I have to say I disagree so much on the balance sheet part. And that's where, to me, the, where the company goes from here is where is where it starts to really get fuzzy for me is there's what management's intentions for the company are and what the financials of the company are saying it should do. And for me, you know, management says it's this intention to be, you know, highly acquisitive, uh, be a consolidator in the experiential real estate business, you know, throws out that hundred billion dollar total addressable market. And it's so like this, we could be so big, right? But here's what concerns me. It's debt to capital is still rising. Uh, it's 50%, you know, not awful, but we're not in a, you know, super conservative type of rent roll. Uh, we're in experiential. So it's not residential where you can push the leverage a little bit harder. It's it's a little bit more capital on its leverage. It's debt to, debt to EBITDA uh, when looking on a comparable basis. I use like Morningstar Y charts for that versus what management's adjustments are. And that comes in at about six uh, with an, and their equity cost. And we'll use, you know, the proxy of their dividend yield right now is 8.1%. So your, your cost of capital is getting high. It just actually had um, a, a revision from the credit ratings going from positive to stable. So there's some concern that there's some de deterioration in its cash flows. And it, it, I, there's the kind of wonky FFO numbers in terms of cash generation. But if you start looking at all the distributions to preferred shares and some of the mezzanine equity that they actually have to pay out, it's it, it really starts to drain cash pretty fast to the point where their internal cash generation isn't as quite as strong as management is claiming it to be. 
So I feel like there's a lane it needs to pick here. Uh, if management has those growth ambitions, it would probably need to cut its dividend to free up some cash for internal development and make uh, issuing new shares not cost prohibitive uh, for acquisition. Or they can say, you know, we're just going to run with what we have. We got a nice dividend yield. We can return a lot of value to shareholders as is right now. Let's focus on, you know, imp making improvements to the existing portfolio. I don't know with a management team that has gone out and said, we want to be acquisitive, we want to be a consolidator and be an empire builder in, in a term I like to use for, for sometimes management. Can they resist that temptation when I think the financial statements are saying, just run with what you have. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to click subscribe if you don't subscribe to my channel already. And as always, this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. Be sure to visit www.fool.com slash Frankel to receive the 10, top 10 best stocks to buy now.